a lot of the people in the room right now are students of Jonathan Edwards. And I mean, really, they're in my Jonathan Edwards seminar. And uh, we were talking earlier this afternoon about different ways in which we think Edwards' legacy continues to be helpful for us as Christians, as theological thinkers, as ministry leaders in the present. In your experience, having interviewed these guys and written this book, can you identify for us a two or three ways in which some of these well-known people who are featured in the book are, are making good on Edward's legacy beyond making good on Edward's commitment to being biblically and theologically learned and helpful pastors? Well, again, one, one of those areas would be the model of a pastor who devotes himself so fervently to study for the purpose of then bringing that truth to bear on, um, on his church. Now, one of the things that I point out, though, as a caution in the book is I'm not sure people want to go to the lengths of spending 14 hours or how many hours a day? 13. Okay, I overestimated him a little bit. But, you know, 13 hours in the study and and mentioning that pastorally that may not be the most helpful model. And in fact, even though if you if you believe like I do that he was right on the on the communion controversy, that perhaps it was his time spent away from the congregation for so long that inhibited his ability to be able to to deal with that, deal with that discussion. Certainly in, in Piper, he's not much of a doctrinal innovator. Um, I mean, even as so far as his Christian hedonism is a very new idea to a lot of people. I mean, any student of Edwards can see that very clearly. You know, so really Piper's, Piper's core theological commitment, his main contribution to the church um, on the Christian hedonism is really, you know, borrowing, borrowing from Edwards. Um, Certainly, one of the, one of the controversial, controversial elements of Edward's legacy that I didn't quite expect when I went into the book was to see the number of reformed theologians who don't like him. And so one of the commitments of Edward's to revival, to really the evangelical enterprise, is another thing that the people I wrote about have followed in his legacy. They have not gone the way of some like D.G. Hart or Michael Horton, uh, Dr. Horton told me in the book. Um, well, D.G. Hart has said some very critical things, of course, about Edwards and really seeing not the second great awakening, as a lot of reform folks see sort of things going off the rail with, with, with Finney, but really seeing things go haywire in the first great awakening in its emphasis on that inward piety and in such uh, introspection that Edwards practiced and taught as well. So those are a in three different areas where I see his legacy picked up. How about if we focus for a little bit on Edwards as a <clears throat> pastor theologian and the influence of the model of the pastor theologian that uh, Jonathan Edwards has exerted on all kinds of other people in the present, those that you focus on in the book. It's interesting to me that the focus of your book is on the young, restless, and reformed And it's probably true that the people who are best known today in evangelical circles in the U.S. for for adopting the pastor-theologian model are Reformed. But at Trinity, looking around the room and saying that not all of us are Reformed and not all of us are young, uh, restless either, uh, I ought to ask you the question, based on your experience as a journalist doing this book, working for Christianity Today generally, what can you tell us about the significance of this model in the evangelical community generally. Are the kinds of people you feature in this book really the the only really important ones who are trying to be pastor theologian type people? Or are there others as well? And and what should we make of this phenomenon? Is it people who want to be like Jonathan Edwards who think about being a pastor in this way? Or are there other folks we could talk about too? Well, your question anticipates one article that I'm in the early stages of working on right now, which is an article about the recovery of the pastor, theologian, pastor, teacher model in the evangelical world. In fact, I was just speaking um, last week after the Together for the Gospel conference in Louisville with uh, the editor at Christianity Today now who handles theology and history. That's his beat. He comes out of a Wesleyan holiness background. And uh, actually... You know, before I ever mentioned that I'd been having conversations with people about this topic and had actually pitched an article like that uh, to Christianity Today, to his editors, he brought up that, in fact, this was something that he'd observed himself elsewhere. Now, we didn't get into a lot of the details about who, so I really, 
I'll turn to the audience and say, afterward, please come tell me about people who you see doing that because, um, I mean, it is true that it is, it is largely Reformed people. I mean, if you're looking at, let's take the Southern Baptist world, you know, as the, as the largest Protestant denomination in America, um, of course, it's not true at all that um, the pastors who are not Reformed in that convention um, are theologians. I mean, they obviously are theologians. But it does not necessarily, it's not necessarily a focus of their ministry. They may be committed to some other different models um, of the pastoral, uh, the pastoral uh, calling. Um, so, you know, it, just, it tends to be people like Mark Dever who stand out in that convention in, in that way. Um, but again, no doubt it's, it's, it's all over the place. But really, at this point, I don't have as many specifics as I would like. I trust that I will have more specifics once I get into the get into the uh, meat of that um, meat of that article. But um, but really, again, the whole enterprise that Trinity here is engaged in fosters that. And Trinity not being a reformed school certainly shows that this is a model that that is that is tenable in the evangelical world, and in fact, one that we should be promoting. So we'll see we'll see how that develops. I mentioned to you that I got an email a few days ago from a mutual friend of ours, a man named Caleb Maskell. Caleb Maskell works at the Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale and uh, is a Ph.D. student in American religious history at Princeton. And Caleb is young and restless but not reformed. He's in the vineyard. Uh, He works at the Jonathan Edwards Center, so obviously he has a big interest in Jonathan Edwards. But somehow he knew we were going to be doing this together today, and he sent me an email Uh, that had an interesting comment in it. So what I'd like to do is just read you, it's very brief, his comment and get a response to you from this because I think this would make for some interesting conversation with the audience as well. Caleb said, I've been thinking about his book, your book, and I really wonder if he's right in his suggestion that the young, restless, and reformed are the cutting edge that's going to form the evangelical culture in America. More specifically, I'm not sure that most people who are Piper lovers, for instance, are excited by Piper's Edwardsian theology. My guess is that they love to be connected to a sense of larger historical narration, and they love his passion, which is why he fits so well with the passion conference culture. I'm not sure that Piper, Mahaney, MacArthur et al. will produce a major wave of reformed thinkers. Rather, I think they're tapping into a group of people who are longing for an integrated worldview that can give Christian interpretation of their questions about the experience of church and world in America. Just a kind of a thought-provoking comment, and I guess I'm interested in hearing from you. Are you suggesting in the book that the young, restless, and reformed really do represent the cutting edge of evangelical culture in America? And insofar as you are, what do you think of a comment like this that maybe these folks that you're focusing on the book aren't going to produce a big hitting generation of reformed theological thinkers? Yes or no? Do you agree with that? Disagree with that? What what really is most attractive about these people to so many of the young and restless today? Sounds like a question Caleb would ask. <laughs> very, very, uh, very thoughtful. And uh, first of all, I think one of the things that that I try to distinguish in the book about the Passion Conference in particular. In fact, uh, I don't think I'm a very popular person among those leaders right now for associating their movement with Reformed theology. In fact, uh, you know, Piper himself doesn't even know if Louis Giglio is Reformed at all. I mean, so, so really, and repeated attempts to talk to them about this topic were rebuffed. So take that, take that for, what it's, for what it's worth. I'd say um, the experience I had talking with people at a passion conference, for example, is that Caleb's absolutely right that that's the gateway. You know, I mean, that's, that nobody is, is immediately engaged with the full spectrum of reform thought as articulated by anyone, let alone John Piper. I mean, at first it's very much, wow, this guy is really engaging as a speaker, and he talks a lot about the glory of God. That sounds like a cool thing. It's just like these songs we've been singing about the glory of God. And in fact, thinking about the glory of God, that's kind of cool, because I was in a church for many years growing up where we didn't, I, where I never heard about the glory of God. I heard, about, I heard a lot about 
the importance of of being nice, and I heard a lot about the importance of believing in the Bible, though we didn't really talk about the Bible that much, at least its contents. And so to hear Piper exegete you know, with that passion is very attractive. So I'd say absolutely, I I wouldn't wouldn't want to suggest that that somehow, you know, in fact, um, one of the best examples I had was one student I sat down with. I asked him about why he was really interested in John Piper, and he said, uh, because of Rob Bell. I said, wow, Rob Bell. You know, he said, yeah, Rob Bell right there in Velvet Elvis has that footnote that says, read everything John Piper has ever written. And I, that was all it took, and I, I, I actually didn't, I feel bad admitting this. I admitted it to him. I didn't believe him. I did not believe him. I was like, no, there's no way Velvet Elvis, Rob Bell says that. Look at, sure enough, it's right there. Now, one of the ironies here is that, unfortunately, uh, Bell inverts Piper's Christian hedonism, gets it kind of backwards. Um, so that's, that shows you that a lot of the people who are really interested in John Piper don't really understand him, don't understand him at all, or are attracted even to, to some of those things. It's very much the externals. What I try to argue for in the book is that at least even as he has this sort of gateway appeal that a lot of people, once they get into him a little bit more, will start to pursue that path. And I think that's where the Edwards element is instructive. Most of the people who love John Piper don't read a lot of Jonathan Edwards, I don't think. But some of them do, and I think that's still significant to point out. As far as the question about Reformed thinkers, I'll deal with this, this one rather, rather quickly, hopefully. Um, part of it depends on what you mean by a thinker. A lot of people just who I wrote about are just trying to get their minds around the rich resources of the past, especially as as seen in the English-American you know, transatlantic Puritan variety. Um, and so they're not really interested in doing a lot of theological innovation, whether within the Reformed framework or, or not. So if part of your element of thinking is being somebody who really advances the theology, I, I don't know that these people will because I don't know that their models are really... I mentioned earlier before, I don't think John Piper is really a theological innovator. You know, so, so if, if, that's your, if that's your thought about what it means to be a Reformed thinker, then probably not. And, um, yeah. Just a quick follow-up. What, what if you're like me and you think that theological innovation is overrated, <laughs> but you really like people who think theologically and want a deeper, richer kind of theological ministry in their churches and so on? What does all this suggest about how optimistic I should be, we should be, about the future of biblically, theologically driven pastoral ministry. Well, I, that's, that's really the... I'm glad you asked that question because that's where my heart is in writing this book. And that was probably... You know, if I, if I wanted... You know, I thought a lot about how people would read the book if they weren't reformed. And I figured, well... A lot of it will just make them angry, you know, just just because it's, you know, it's it's a whole lot of reform theology and it's a whole lot of people talking about how much they love reform theology, and that's and that's probably not, not going to be very fun. But I thought a step further than that, there should be two responses, and this is from from everybody across the spectrum. I hope the one response is that the the church has has been failing to communicate. I mean. Let's just put it in very simple terms to catechize. I, this is why Christian Smith's work, sociological work, has been so critical to my thinking on this topic. His articulation of a moralistic, therapeutic deism characterizing the youth in our churches. I mean, we're all culp- culpable for that. Maybe some of us more than others, but we all as evangelicals share in that. And I don't think we should be patting ourselves on the back because we're slightly better than the mainline Protestants and the Jews, you know, as he lists in that in that book, or the Roman Catholics. I mean, so it's so if that I mean, that one thing is just really a call to call to concern. But then I hope that my book is just one small example of showing how these theologically driven ministries are reaching young people. 
And especially Reformed theologians are doing that. Not necess- I, don't, I don't know if I'd say it's because I had a lot of Reformed people tell me, and I'd ask them, so why is this happening now? And they'd say, because Reformed theology is true. And I'd say, well, that doesn't really help me. I mean, if, it, if, it were tr- if it's true now, then presumably it was true 20 years ago, right? You know? So, so what's the difference now? I think one difference is that the type of ministry that you're talking about, a number of Reformed people are simply just doing it. And a lot of people find that, find that to be very, very attractive, precisely because, as I said before, the background they're coming from just didn't do much of that, and it's very appealing. One of the things I heard consistently from Southern Baptists in particular is that we've been thumping the Bible for a long time. Now we need to open it up and see what it says. I don't hear me wrong to suggest that that will inevitably lead you, lead you toward a reformed persuasion. All I'm saying there is that I think that can be a tendency in a lot of evangelicalism to fight those older battles, not realizing those older battles are kind of gone now. How about we just fight the battle of us trying to apply God's truth to our lives? That's tough enough. Thanks, Colin. Very helpful. I think this would be a good time to turn to the audience and ask if there are any comments or questions that you all want to raise. Um, Owen, what's the procedure? Do, do people need to speak into a microphone, or may they just stand up? and? Okay. Well, Owen, we'll take the microphone. There are a couple of hands right up here, people who are ready to go. I guess uh, my question would be, um, I think the big question that McLaren and uh, Bell are asking are, questions related to culture and I don't always like their answers but at least they're you know I think they're asking some good questions do you from what you saw I I mean I've heard a little bit of Driscoll do you see this kind of sense we're just going to be reformed people will be attracted to it or do you see um, because when you're thinking about cutting edge reformed Mm -hmm. theologians there probably needs to be a cultural dynamic where they're thinking about how to repackage and deal with Reformed theology and minister in a postmodern context. Do you yeah. see a lot of wrestling um, with those questions um, to give more constructive answers yeah. to the good questions that McLaren and Bell are asking? Yeah, yeah I think that's... Um, is this on? You, yeah, that sounds like it. Um, that's a great question and a, and a great... It's, it's where a lot of my thinking has been lately, sort of moving forward from some of the things that I learned in the process of writing this article or writing this book. Um, just just at the last event for the Gospel Conference just a couple of weeks ago, I think one of the most crucial questions that was raised by Mark Dever uh, was addressed to the, the social implications of the Gospel, relating the social implications of the Gospel to what is the Gospel essence. That is an area right now that I think that's very much open for for debate. I think a lot of the young restless reformed and putting myself in, in, in that camp are somewhere between having a lot of respect for people like Mark Dever and a lot of respect also for people like Tim Keller. You know, and and they don't agree on cultural on approaches to culture. They don't agree at all. In fact, anybody who just visits their churches can see a very big difference in how they engage the culture. I think it's I think there is a lot of thought in that way. Most of what Driscoll's doing that I can pick up is just following in Keller's wake, only with an extremely different tone, basically, but a lot of the city focus and, and stuff like that. So, so I mean, I see a lot of that being done by, by Tim Keller. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe, it's some of their, maybe it's his Presbyterian difference and Mark Dever's Baptist difference. There are a lot of, there's a significant variety on issues like that among the people I profiled. So, so there definitely is some of that thinking and, um, you know, I've, I've had to engage a lot of it lately because it is that next question um, because uh, I'm doing a discussion with uh, Tony Jones, the coordinator of Emergent Village for Christianity Today, and a lot of it's to find out in the critiques, some of the critiques I'm making and what he's writing about Emergent, what are some of the commonalities and what, what do both groups see about the culture going forward? You may uh, uh, have stated this in your book. I haven't, I haven't read your book, but mm-hmm. um, when you talk about reformed uh, mm-hmm. as a category, as a label, mm-hmm. 
course, there's diversity and, and some, some uh, breadth there. Right. But, but what, is the, what is the common denominator yeah. that, it, that, you, that, is, uh, that binds yeah. everyone that you associate yeah. with being reformed? And, and yeah. related to that, mm-hmm. one thing that doesn't seem to come up in your uh, language mm-hmm. is confessions. Is, yeah. Are, yeah. is interest and seriousness about confessions part of this uh, young restless and reformed or not? Yeah, great questions. Uh, you'll you'll like the discussion with, with uh, Michael Horton in the book because this is exactly the point he raised, and I, and I think it's a... You know, as a journalist, I have a certain obligation to, or a certain opportunity to sort of name and shape things that come out. But at the same time, I'm, I'm beholden to what people are telling me, and there's no good term, whether reformed or Calvinistic, that I'm trying to trying to use here. Because one of the points Dr. Horton makes is, five points of Calvinism, great. Sovereignty of God, great. Those would be the things that unite. Okay, so that's all well and good. But just please do not call this reformed. Reform means the Westminster Confession. Reform, ref, that's what reform means. And you can't be a Baptist like I am and be reformed, you know, from, you know, from, uh, from his perspective. So there's a lot of that really tension about what it's called. So, again, it's those two things, the five points, the sovereignty of God, basically, that unite. Um, and they're using the terms reform and Calvinistic. When I talk to people about why do you use which term, it's a total preference thing. I mean, it's just like some, some like reform better because it kind of distances yourself from Calvin being a hold to him. But some are recognized that, well, to be reform means some of those confessions. Maybe I should just be more Cal. It doesn't make sense. So, so except for some of the yeah. one side, the, the confessions aren't, aren't really much of an interest in well, there are definitely confessions, but if you're talking to a Dr. Moeller, you know, Al Moeller or Mark Dever or something, it's going to be the New London. You know, I mean, it's going to be different confessions. You know, so there is there is an interest in confessions, but if your question is more from like the Westminster, there's a lot of appreciation for it, but there's that one big holdup in there, you know, that baptism part that a lot of people that I wrote about just can't can't, can't make that jump. I believe that the cabinet resurgence in the modern era began in the early 70s when I was in college. And um, a lot of um, academic types more and more became reformed Catholic. Um, and under, I don't know when exactly the time frame is yeah. for now, yeah. but uh, I wonder if you have any ideas about the uh, relationship there. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, I would... Um, my, my book focused more by necessity than anything else journalistically on young people, so mostly 18 to 35. It's also a group that I'm most familiar with for obvious reasons. So, um, so that, that resurgence, I, I, I don't know exactly how I, I date that. I didn't focus on that too much because um, it's kind of arbitrary. Um, I'll leave that up to historians. But uh, um, one key moment would definitely be the Passion Conferences because that was the opportunity. I mean, John Piper was a pretty significant figure. You know, he'd written Desiring God. A lot of people had heard of him before. But he wasn't ex- exposed to young people the way he is now until the Passion Conferences. If you think of his Don't Waste Your Life book, for example, I think that's his best-selling book that came out in 2000 after the largest Passion conference. Um, but absolutely, if you want to go back further, you know, certainly some people I've, I um, talk about, I mean, I talked to both uh, uh, J.I. Packer and R.C. Sproul in that book, but most of them sharing the perspective of, yeah, we've been doing these, we've been doing these Puritan conferences for a while. Not many people showed up, but we were doing them, <laughs> you know. So, so there was something going on there, but I don't know if you call that a resurgence. Uh, just as a follow-up, um, yeah. I attended Westminster Theological Seminary in the yeah. 70s, and um, it's independent but Presbyterian roots. Right. And when I was there, two-thirds of the student body were Baptists. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, they've infiltrated even Westminster. <laughs> One of the discussions I had with Dr. Horton was uh, when he was telling me, don't call it Reformed, was but Westminster Se- Seminary in California has a Reformed Baptist track. That's related there. So maybe it's not my problem so much as we've all got a problem of how do you name name all this. I don't know. 
Hey, Colin. I wonder if you could uh, comment. What role do you think the Internet has played in oh, yeah. the resurgence of Calvinism? Yeah. That's just a topic of discussion that I've had with Tony Jones, you know, because it seems like if you're going out there looking at all the different sort of theology-oriented blogs today, it's not exclusive by any means, but you'll find a lot of reformed ones from young people and a lot of emergent ones. Um, the Internet is key because I think it's key for any constituency that is not the majority in, in a certain place. Like they can't just and, – and a lot of people I talked about, they may be the only reformed pastor on a staff – that may just have a baseline evangelical statement of faith, so it doesn't exclude Reformed theology, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't promote it either. Those people going to conferences like Together for the Gospel, something like that, then they meet a lot of people and they connect over the web. I mean, absolutely. I mean, just look at the influence of a, of a small little blog like Justin Taylor's Between Two Worlds, you know, just as a resource for promoting all the different things being written. So... It does develop that little virtual community for people. You know, take the Southern Baptist Convention, for example. Blogging is significant across the board in the SBC for people who are upset about, you know, feel disenfranchised by the leadership over different issues, um, tongues. That's been the most recent controversy. But also, you know, if you're the little founders, you know, maybe it's Southern Baptist Church, the Reformed affiliated Southern Baptist Church, you're probably not a majority within your within your group in the area. So, you know, places like the Internet are a place you can go, and all of a sudden you're reading Justin Taylor's blog and you feel like a majority. <laughs> you know. so. What factors uh, did you find have led to the resurgence of interest, yeah. and did one or more of them surprise you? Yeah, a great question. Um, I, look at, uh, I look at three different... TRs as, as being sort of factors that contribute. Um, a desire for transformation, you know, a real draw f- for people to, you know, that would, again, to use the Southern Baptist Convention as an example, a concern that, you know, we talk a lot about the importance of inerrancy and the importance of Scripture, but what difference is it making in our lives? So a, a, an interest in, you know, at recognizing that as being a problem in the evangelical world seeing how theology does engender, you know, by the Holy Spirit, transformed lives. So look at transformation. I also look at transcendence. Uh, transcendence being, again, we've been talking about from the Passion Conferences early, you know, focus on, boy, I'm not used to this glory of God stuff, but it's a really inspiring theme to sing about, according to Scripture. So that is sort of an entry point. And then finally, tradition. Um, now, John Piper did not agree with me on this point, which made me think a lot about about whether I should include it in there. But even if it's, um, you know, I think uh, uh, Dr. McCall in his recent uh, paper, in his recent discussion, you know, the two cheers about um, about Reformed theology and resurgence made a good point of, you know, the group I'm writing about is very selectively appropriating a certain, again, transatlantic Puritan evangelical awakening Type group, um, but even that is, in my opinion, better than nothing, of appropriating some tradition to a tradition-starved evangelicalism. Um, so maybe that was my most surprise. I mean, I think probably all three of them were surprising. Not as surprising to me in some way. It's just because that's the air I've been breathing for a while in evangelicalism, and probably for most people that I interviewed. At the same time, though, it may be very surprising to people who develop their church growth techniques precisely to counter everything that I'm writing about. You know, I mean, you know, you got to talk about things that are very practical to people, you know, not too much doctrine, you know, things like that. So maybe very surprising to them, but not surprising to me. I'm Kelvin. Uh, I'm an Armenian, and uh, i got two interesting questions to ask. One is that, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this in your book, but... I have found that uh, quite a lot of young people who have been introduced to Piper uh, have first read his book, uh, Let the Nations Be Glad, yeah, that's true. which was actually mm-hmm. heavily promoted by the U.S. Center for World Mission mm-hmm. to spread the cause of missions among churches and people who are doing short-term mission. Yeah. So this introduced a lot of people uh, to mm-hmm. Piper and his theology. Yeah. My question is that in the course of doing your book and your conversations, mm-hmm. as far as missions and outreach, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I see. I detect two strands in uh, the reform uh, movement. One is that uh, there is uh, a very, very strong tendency among people who are very passionate about the reform theology to try to evangelize people who are Armenians, mm. uh, sort of an yeah. intra-mission within uh, evangelical <laughs> circles. Yeah. Do yeah, you see uh, this in your own ongoing conversations in that? But on a larger scale, have you picked up any tendencies as far as uh, churches which are reformed mm -hmm. that have uh, changed or found things to be unique in world evangelism in terms of Piper's own uh, paradigm uh, in, of mission, which is uh, you know, missions exist because worship yeah, doesn't, doesn't yeah. which has now really become a very dominant paradigm for missions, yeah. but yet there are other paradigms of mission that, uh, like for example, Stott's paradigm, which is that missions exist because God loves, yeah. and so we love others. Uh, how have you found that interaction? Yeah, well, I found one thing that was interesting about Reformed pastors who I would talk about, you know, they would, they would, you know, try to not be very boastful about a lot of things, but then you'd bring up missions, and all of a sudden they would just start bragging like crazy about how much money their church gives to missions. Now, I consider that to be actually a really good thing and a very, very encouraging thing, but it was like the one thing they felt like, you know, they... Um, you know, because maybe it wasn't their doing. You know, it's like it's the people who are giving the money toward this. So I'd have people say, you know, Presbyterians say, there's no Baptist church in town that gives half of what we give to missions. <laughs> you know, or, you know, things like that, some of those old, you know, those old rivalry things. I don't know that there's anything unique about that, about that paradigm of how they're applying it. I, I know that one woman um, who I talked to who worked in a closed country, a very young woman, um, uh, one of the things she said was, I mean, spoke with a certain level of comfort that she had labored in a very difficult situation and had seen no no converts. Now, I mean, you didn't, I didn't hear her agonizing over that fact. I'm sure she did, but that wasn't what she came out. The key there was, I was faithful. I was faithful in in promoting the gospel and however I could, and uh, God was glorified in that. Um, so, so from some different perspectives, that may be an, an unsettling thing, thing to hear, but that was certainly her perspective. What I heard from the other end of the spectrum in the, in the Southern Baptist um, setting was that, of course, this Reformed theology is, is going to kill our missions because you can't get Southern Baptists. A leading Southern Baptist theologian told me this. He said, you can't get Southern Baptists to evangelize unless they believe that they are the ones who are sending their friends and family to hell because they're not evangelizing. So if you take away that plank from them and leave it up to God, then you've just killed Southern Baptist missions because that's been our key appeal this whole time. Uh, so, I mean, you can see very distinct differences there. I wouldn't say either one is ne necessarily paradigmatic for the different theologies, but I saw a very different, different approach there. In general, Reformed people, well, to answer your first question again, they, they definitely, you know, you hear a lot of discussion about the cage stage of Reformed theology. When you realize and come to this knowledge of the doctrines of grace and then you just try to convert everybody around you just like you, um, just like when you became a Christian. Um, that's why the first chapter and the working title of the book was Born Again Again. You know, because of that emphasis that I continually heard from people. Thankfully, there are a lot of voices speaking out and saying, well, maybe that's not the best use of our time. After all, if you're reformed, you don't believe you can argue anybody into that anyway. You know, so, um, but uh, I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but those are different missions things I picked up. We have time for just one more question, if anybody has one. A repeat question. Was there a Piper book that... Uh, people you interviewed said was the most influential or yeah. was the thing that maybe got them into reform theology? One book in particular mentioned? Well, see, now that's an interesting question because the one does not follow the other um, in the people I talked about. Desiring God is the most influential book, okay. but it didn't lead them to Calvinism. Okay. It led them to Piper. I mean, it was, it was what made them excited about Piper. So, I mean, the theology is there. I mean, obviously, you know, Piper doesn't write much of anything where that theology isn't 
right there at the forefront. Um, can't separate those two. But it's not necessarily explicit. It's certainly not the purpose of that book, which is probably why it's able to reach a number of people who aren't reformed. So I think it's just that was sort of, again, an entry-level book that people from a wide spectrum could believe and get on board with and then maybe would just explore his other works. Um, the companion volume to Desiring God is, is actually much more explicit about about Reformed theology. So maybe that's where they headed from there, or maybe they just went to the Desiring God website and found the, you know, what we believe about the five points of Calvinism or, or whatever. Thanks, Colin, very much for coming. Thank you all uh, for coming and listening. Um, I'm really grateful to you, Colin, for highlighting uh, the importance for a lot of folks in the evangelical world today yeah. of biblically and theologically driven ministry. Mm -hmm. That certainly is at the center of the mission of the Henry Center, yeah. which is all about bridging the gap between the academy and the church, promoting biblically and theologically driven ministry, and then conversely, promoting ministry-oriented theological education. Yeah. And uh, we're not a strictly Calvinist organization. In <laughs> fact, we're directed by a Lutheran, and we have <laughs> Arminians on our board and everything else. <laughs> But I think this is a fantastic book, and I commend it highly to you. Uh, young, Restless, and Reformed, a journalist journey with the new Calvinists. I would be remiss if I didn't let you know that it's on sale at the back of the room, and it's 30% off. Uh, I recommend that you take it and read it. Uh, <laughs> at least 10%. Uh, please join me in thanking Colin for being with us.